All right, hello everybody. Welcome to another MediGov seminar. Today is November 8th, 2023. Um, today we are joined by uh, Stocko, um, who, Stocko Tronsko, uh, Troncoso, who will be uh, presenting on some of the work that uh, they have been doing on Disco, uh, which is a uh, decentralized cooperative uh, organizations project. Uh, Stocko is a Groundwork Fellows fellow with us. Um, the Groundwork Fellowship is focused on the intersection of internet governance, design, and marginalization. And today we're going to hear from Stocko on some of the work that they've been doing around Disco. Um, Stocko also has a background in uh, uh, the commons, peer-to-peer -peer politics, uh, open culture, post-growth futures, platform and open cooperativism, decentralized governance, blockchain, and more. Uh, and does this work with disco.coop, commons transition, and guerrilla translation. Um, Stocko is one of four uh, fellows that we've worked with this year as part of the fellowship, and I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing the work that uh, has been done in the months since the fellowship started. Um, I'm also going to um, be moderating the discussion later on. So if there are questions or comments for Stocko as we go on today, um, please feel free to share them in the chat. Um, if you would prefer to simply speak uh, instead of typing your comments or questions, you can type the word stack, um, S-T-A-C-K, and then I'll just add you to the list of people who are um, in the queue for speaking. Um, I'm also going to be screen sharing. And so, um, Stocko, uh, as mentioned, when you would like me to proceed to the next slide, just say proceed or next, and hopefully we can work out the coordination um, in a kind of uh, smooth manner. Um, so let me start uh, screen sharing, and then I will pass it over to Stocko. Okay, let's make it full screen, Sent. Yes. What is going to presentation mode? Okay, so welcome everyone. This is actually my second Metagov seminar. It's been a pleasure being part of the fellowship and also meeting some folks in person during the web. This is the work that we've been doing, not only this year, but between the Real Media Collective and Disco for the last 10 years. So I'm going to talk first about Disco and then about governance as it pertains to the interest of meta governance or maybe your work, so you can see where we're coming from. Next. So for those not familiar, I'm not assuming familiarity with Disco. Disco is a many-headed hydra, so maybe we can chop off a few heads. Explaining Disco is difficult. It's kind of like explaining how to ride a bicycle. I can enthuse about the health and transportation benefits of cycling, but until you get in a bicycle, you can't see what it's all about. So Disco is something that in our experience, once people get it, then they know how to articulate it for their own purposes. So instead of a direct definition, I'm going to give you three provocations or three coordinates of where Disco comes from and is headed. And then if that doesn't satisfy you, I'll give you a little, a little snippet. Um, so the first definition of Disco is next. Disco is a brand, and brand are memetic complexes um, that use both so social sciences, design, artistry, etc., to motivate people to consume, to buy things that they may not or may not need, but that they identify with. So brands are very potent and uh, great drivers of our economy. Brands sell you things. So what does Disco sell you as a brand? Well, next. Disco is selling you what no one else will sell you, which is anti-capitalist, decolonial, and intersectional feminist futures. This is what we want to see on the label. Um, these are the motivating vectors that we want to promote so we can have different outcomes with our, with our economy. And as a brand is really inclusive because Disco is also Next. It's an open source conspiracy, which as far as conspiracies goes, makes it especially inclusive. And like any good conspiracy, next. 
the goal of the conspiracy is to take over the world. And of course, this is funny and ridiculous, but it's also really serious, because I think that we can all agree that we're in the midst of a convergence of social we go. and environmental crises. Um, so why would we want to take over the world? Why would we want to have this open source conspiracy to take it back? Um, we come from the generation of Occupy, where many of us figured out we can actually do things better ourselves and self-organize and not be afraid of promoting other visions and futures. And the way to take over the world, or well, one of the ways would be next. We can see this go as an economic life action role-playing game. If you take neoliberal economics, you can see it as a game with its own rules that you haven't consented to, and that many people in the world have not consented to, yet this game drives the actions, drives colonialism, drives environmental degradation, etc. So in this spirit of an open source conspiracy, is what if we create a new game? What if we create a new rule book of economics that comes from the ground up? Economics that gathers all the innovations of alternative economics to give us something greater than the sum of the parts. So the mission of DISCO is creating the law of this live action role playing game so you can get together with your peers and develop your own game. And next, the purpose over here is to go from segregated economic alternatives to actual economic counterpower. Again, with this belief that the many, the many types of economies which are invisibilized by capitalism actually have more power than capitalist economics. So the gist of Disco is how do we make these alternatives communicate with each other to have this economic, to have this economic counterpower? And if those definitions do not satisfy you, um, I can give you like a snippet. Disco is a methodology for small groups of four to twenty people to self-organize with commons economics and feminist economics. First of all, to have sustainable livelihoods, and then to meet up with other discos to create, create more complex economic artifacts. But there's always a focus on small groups. Okay, so um, next. So here we come to right, right, right. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just. I guess I have, wasn't muted. I was saying four twenty groups to federate. Yeah, you've got for you've got the reference over there. So that's the number that we recommend. Um, why? It's because this goes based on care work, and you cannot care, you cannot um, actually activate relations of care in a network of 150 people. So the Damba number that we recommend goes down considerably, and you know um, it takes two to tango, but it takes three or four to disco. Um, this doesn't mean that you can't join together into more complex artifacts, but you want to keep this basic group of people that you have a relationality with um, in these numbers. So governance. Um, governance as it pertains to MetaGov, etc., and governance in the digital realm. Just the word governance comes with its own inbuilt biases that I think are worth examining. So governance, next. comes from the grid governance, which literally means to steer. And by steering, you obviously have someone who is producing the action towards others. So you already have a division between the governed and the governing and the governors. And of course, in the case of Greece, the governors are the ownership classes. They're the oligarchs. They're obviously not the slaves, obviously not the women. So when we talk about governance um, in political economy since the 90s, there has been, you know, in liberal economics, this notable assumption that there's an expert class which governs. And you can see this in the blockchain space. Um, we can have a series of people design smart contracts for people to buy in and to follow and to make these great economic schemes. But if there's no cultural legibility where people feel ownership of how they're governing themselves, then that's not the type of governance that we want to see. Although historical examples could be next. An Iroquois Grand Council, governed by consensus, which I'm critical of, but hey, 
here we have 75% of the mothers and 75% of the men actually ratifying the session. So no decision, no decision goes forward and unless it has that type of ratification. This gives rise to a very different type of political economy, which I would associate with the commons. The commons understood as um, a social process where a group of people gather around a gift or a resource, whether it's material or cultural, and govern it according to their own norms and protocols, not those of the market, not those of the state. Or the state. And the commons is nothing new. I mean, you can argue that this is the de facto mode of social organization. So coming from the commons and um, towards governance, um, we want to know what we're governing towards. What is the purpose of governance? And I would say next, that the purpose is to articulate value. We want to have agreements um, on our behavior and on our action to promote our values. And of course, in neoliberal economics, there's a great dichotomy um, between the purported values of liberalism or the universal declaration of human rights and the actual value that is tracked and measured in the economy. So to talk about value, next. Here are a few pointers. Um, and this is riffing mainly on David Graeber, um, both towards the definition of value and that the first 5,000 years. Value is um, collective behavior. It's a process guiding our collective be, um, our behavior. It's, um, and it can, it can be divided into three components, which are production, what we make, recording, how we tally our productive actions, and actualization, how they manifest. So in capitalism, production is for profit uh, and extractive and built on our legacy of colonialism and market driven. Recording is opaque and abstract. And one of the particularities of capitalist recording is that recording lets you have more capital, meaning numbers make more numbers. So you can see with things like derivatives, etc., that just the act of recording promotes more information that has no con effects on the real world. And actualization in capitalism is exchange values. Only the only thing that's value is that, that those things that can be traded and sold in the market. In a disco, in common space peer production, in the commons, production is communal, and both in sense of ownership and in the sense of decision making. We decide together what to produce for need. Recording is transparent and uh, based on other notions, which I will speak about. And actualization is for use value, not for exchange value. Actualization means things that can be shared things that can be used over and over, not merely sold as, as commodities or services. Something else that Graeber has said that I find particularly illuminating is that often the discussion on value is about who appropriates the surplus value. The working class, the precariat, the disenfranchised, and people with cool haircuts. It doesn't matter, but this doesn't strike at the question of co-determining what value really is and working towards the articulation of new values, again, away from, from capitalism. And what we propose in this go is that this articulation of value be centered on, next, on care. And I would say that capitalism is actively anti-care. Um, unfortunately, we cannot do this. You may care about things, you may care about the environment, but current economics and current value-driven propositions will not allow you to do that, okay? And to give a definition of care, next. Here's a quote from Berenice Fisher and John Tronto. And they say, on the most general level, we suggest that caring be viewed as a species activity that includes everything we do to maintain, continue and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. That world includes our bodies, ourselves and our environment all of which we seek to interweave in a complex life-sustaining way. So this is the kind of value proposition that this co wants to work towards with its governance proposition. Caring for ourselves and caring for, caring for the planet urgently, as um, everyone can understand care, and everyone can understand that the application of care towards these actions can remedy many of the problems that we find ourselves mired in. Next. So governance modeling, 
Um, by modeling, I mean there's no one governance model. There's no perfect solution. Uh, and if we're talking about groups of four to 20 persons, governance has to be based on their specificity. Um, another of the critiques that we have in Disco, both of blockchain culture, but even coming from earlier internet cultures and commons based peer production is this obsession with scaling. And scaling is the mentality of colonialism. Um, I may have something small and I think that it's really cool, so I'm going to scale it. And in the act of scaling it, I will be raising existing cultural traditions that may not be able to defend themselves against the scaling. So here we propose federation and we propose replication. So as far as governance goes, we're going to give next patterns instead of blueprints. Blueprints assumes that all possible variables have already been worked out within certain parameters. And again, you can see this as smart contracts, or you can see this as um, the results of game theory, rather than the messiness of human life, emotions, and uh, things that just happen. So a pattern approach um, is what we suggest for any organization that wants to delve into, into governance. And um, for a short definition of patterns, next. Here we have an extract by... My mentors, David Bolg and Silke Helfrich, talking about um, Christopher Alexander. In Alexander's view, a pattern describes a problem that occurs over and over again in our environment, and then describes the core, the kernel of a solution to that problem in such a way that you can use this solution a million times over without ever doing it the same way twice. And this is the ultimate purpose of this governance, meaning you figure out your governance for your situation and you document it. And you document it so there's a precedent that's accessible that's taggable, that has metadata that you can search for so that other people can be inspired by your solution, but then arrive at arrive at those. Next. Okay, so the, the four main patterns of disco governance are roles, um, who's showing up, who are the people and what do they do? Elements, um, how you work together, what kind of um, social agreements you can enter to make sure that this value proposition towards care is being carried out. Value, recording. How do you record the value of contributions and decisions? Um, there's four elements you can find in any organization. So we encourage people to examine this when they come out, when they're questioning their own, their own governance. Um, we're going to go through each of them. So sent, if you go to the next one. So roles, this is about um, your group. Um, groups are very heterogeneous. Um, it's not a question of um, people who show up for 40 hours a week anymore. Some people may show up more, other people may show up less, etc. Some people may be more committed. So it's important to distinguish the roles and the intensity of the relationality within roles. So next. Within this co-governance, we talk about casual or committed relationships. So if I was to, to ask a center about Metagov, maybe there's X number of people that show up to the seminars. There's X number of people that show up in the Slack. But there's densities. There's densities of those who show up. And often you find imbalances um, between people who put in like a lot of care work, yeah, and people who just show up with regularity and then disappear. So it's important to have commitments. And you can see this like relationships. So you can have casual relationships. Hey, I like you, I check you out, we go out for dinner and then we have fun later. And then maybe see you never. And then you have committed relationships. I expect you to be there for me. And between casual and committed relationships, this time talking about organizations, we have dating. This is where you check each other out. So in this call, we recommend a dating phase of nine months where you incorporate people with intensive and bi-directional mentoring. Meaning, when you incorporate someone in a disco, you're not just handing them the rule book, you're entering in dialogue with them with the assumption that you can learn from people coming in so that they can also have a sense of ownership. This allows people to um, accrue contributions to the work that they're doing and then be rewarded according to the stage of dating that they're at until they become, until they become committed. Um, next. Elements are modular working practices that we've been experimenting with for the last 10 years. 
that we suggest that collectives can explore, incorporate, and make their own to, again, smooth both their productive and their reproductive work. And some elements are next. Community rhythms. It's very important for working collectives to have set rhythms when you show up. Do you have a daily rhythm? Do you have a daily check-in? Do you have a weekly check-in? Do you have like a bi-weekly call where you're examining, I don't know, whether it's KPIs or purposes, how you're doing and how you're feeling? Do you have a quarterly evaluation? So it's very important to, um, to have this rhythm stated and for everyone, according to the level of contribution, to be more, more or less present within these rhythms. Mutual support is all the invisible work that's routinely done in organizations and usually highly gendered of how people feel. Um, here, we, we suggest that if you are working in a group, that every month you take an hour and you have a call with someone where someone, someone else from the group just listens to you for an hour. It's just there for you. No questions asked, you just show up and you can do like a conga line of mutual support. This is good because you get to know people away from their productive matrix and you also have a space just to be yourself and have someone to, to listen to you. Commitment statement is something that you can do quarterly um, and this usually follows a template where you basically write up what you will be doing, what your commitment will be to the organization. And the commitment statement is self-evaluated. No one's going to be evaluating your work by you, but you um, on a quarterly basis. So after three months, you say, oh, I did this. I held my commitment or I didn't, um, or I couldn't carry it through, which is a very important litmus test for organizations to see what's working, what isn't. And working circles are permeable areas of specialization. Um, so in an organization, you may need to have someone doing the finances and the taxes. You may need to have someone doing the social media and communication. Maybe someone else is doing research. Um, this will pertain to economic democracy, which I talk about in a minute. But these areas of specialization are how to be clear in the kind of work that you feel compelled to do, but also on the kind of work that you don't want to do on red lines, etc. So we make sure that um, there's a balance. There's a balance between desirable and less desirable work. And you know who to attend to when you want to work in a specific area. Next, okay, value tracking. So we spoke about um, the recording of value earlier. And in this code, rather than basing ourselves solely on exchange value or on abstract notions like GDP, we encourage people to measure three types of value. Next. So the first one is the work that is recognized in the market, um, livelihood work. If you're a co-op that is offering goods and services, this is what this is how you cover your nut. This is what you get paid for. If you're a non-profit, livelihood work is the funded work that supports whatever project proposal you've been awarded a grant for. Um, but part of this goes to cover love work. And love work is voluntary work done for the commons. Uh, voluntary work or sweat equity is done continuously, but it's often invisibilized. And sometimes in groups, some people do um, this love work while other people appropriate it to get livelihood. And again, this is nothing new. And this is, you can routinely see this in the creator economy or YouTube people that um, are doing things for free to then be able to promote products, etc. But in this code, we codify it. So livelihood work and love work are both types of productive work. The first is recognized by the market. The second isn't, but is recognized by the disco. And there's a value distribution that I'll talk about in a minute. The third one is reproductive work, care work. And care work, um, there's two types of it. It's caring for the mission of your organization. If your disco, if your co-op has a spirit, has a set of values that you want to work towards, you want to make sure that you're caring, um, that you're feeding them actively so that it thrives. And it's also caring for the people in the organization with practices like mutual support. Um, care work is really important. Um, away from capitalism and in activist circles, you often find that a lot of people doing the admin are doing the shit work because there's no, there's no specialized administrative staff doing that. Um, this is the less showy work, but it's important. It's um, work that's vital to keep organizations running. So we want to visualize it. Okay, 
And the fourth pattern of disco governance, yeah, you're going the hang of it, is decision making. Next. Um, and here I want to quote Robin Hanel of Paracon. If you're familiar with Paracon, Paracon is a really cool participatory economics. It's a really cool concept that I find unrealistic. And this goes a way to build bridges towards futures like Paracon in the here, in the here and now. But still, it has some um, great value. So what Robin Hanel says about economic democracy is that the problem with majority rule is simple. When a decision has a greater effect on some people than others, by giving each person equal vote, those more affected by decision can find themselves overruled by those who are less affected. And this is something that you can see in COPs with one person, one vote. Going on, economic democracy should be defined as decision-making input and power in proportion to the degree one is affected by different economic choices. We call this economic self-management and believe that thinking about achieving economic self-management for everyone is the best way to think about achieving economic democracy. There's not one type of decision. Um, your economic decisions are gonna have knock-on effects on the people implementing them or the people affected by them. So we need to seek out mechanisms so these decisions are made in proportion to how um, they will bounce back on you or on other groups. So next. So in this code governance, um, decision-making can be um, differentiated between cash role or dated members and, and committed members. So everyone is invited to vote, but only committed members um, have um, veto power or make binding, binding decisions. It's also based on who's showing up on the rhythms. If someone hasn't showed up for three months and their decision proves to be a hindrance, maybe you can say, well, you haven't shown up and you're not being as affected by this decision. So we're going to prioritize other people's um, deficient decision. Who's affecting? If it's a decision which is within one person's proven expertise and experience um, within their working circle, maybe it's, again, this is all with the supposition of like conflicts and um when decision is when not everyone is making making the the, um, the same choice, so working circles are another important distinction that can help you fine grain this type of decision making. Multi constituent consultation um, corps are really good at democratizing ownership and decision making for those involved in the productive process in the legal entity and um, and the co op, but not so much on those who are affected by the economic activity. So. Here we took inspiration from social care co-ops in Emilia, Romania and Quebec. So for example, in the areas of medicine and caretaking, you have four types of stakeholders. Um, you have the state who's providing the funding, you have the professionals, the doctors and the nurses, you have the patients and you have the family members. So this is a much richer conversation on what actions to partake rather than something directed from the top down. In this go, we encourage, again, with logic and rhythms, if you have a board, you check in with the board every three months, or when you're stuck in a decision, you go there. And all this historical credits, and this has to do with the measurement of value, that I'll come back to in a minute. And uh, those who have invested the most in the disco, when there's a conflict, um, those who have a bigger stake should have more decision-making power. But again, um, in principle, in our experience, it's mostly one person, one vote. And it doesn't matter if it's a casual or committed member, because when you build a good culture of collaboration, and when you have clear communication, decisions tend to go smoothly. But having all these mechanisms, which are based on your investment in the working collective, um, can be quite helpful in getting on the stack. Next. Um, also, just going to take the opportunity, we should start to move into the discussion portion of the seminar. So maybe like another three or four minutes. Okay, yeah, let me see what I've got next. Yeah, um, I think that in five minutes, I can give you a practical example of this called value tracking, and then we can move it to the discussion. So we're imagining value in action. This is next. This is an infographic that we made on how this co value tracking works and how value is distributed. I have this calculus, so I, um, <laughs> this was checked by someone who knows their math. Um, so this co economics and governance are determined by each individual disco. And how it works is that each member in the disco is a shareholder whose work is accounted in three ways. And these are value streams. We've spoken about them, livelihood, love, work, care, work. So this shares determine 
um, instead of an corporation where you get like the payout of the shares at the end of the year based on your economic access, your payout is based on your on your contributions. Um, open value accounting. Um, when you're doing productive work, we recommend that the productive work is based on tokens, meaning if it's translation, if it's lines on codes, that's something that you can count. And that care work is measured in time and hours. But you can explore the tensions between tokenization and time tracking and also just casual notions of value, reporting, um, speaking about what you valued. Care work is all the reproductive work done to maintain the disco and keeps its members happy. Um, so when working all three streams has been accounted for, its type of share is paid out on a monthly basis, we recommend, based on current liquidity. So if a disco has 10,000 euros of cash available in one month, 75% is going to go towards livelihood shares, what you've accrued as productive work recognized as the market. 25 goes towards love work shares, which is um, the type of commons creating work that is not recognized by, by the market. So each bucket is divided according to individual members shares in livelihood. Here we have these three characters. Joanina has 25% of livelihood shares and 40% of love shares. So they paid this much. I'm going to go quickly through this, but you can, I can share the infographics so you can check the math. Gayatri has 50% of livelihood shares and 25% of love shares. Julio has 25 and 35. What this means is that those who are doing more voluntary work are not penalized over those who are doing work recognized by the market. It evens out. And next share, next slide, sorry. And care work is like a tax. So if everyone has done the same amount of care work proportionally to their time investment, then the payment remains the same. But if there's been, if you see over there where it says eight hours, four hours, three hours, because there's differential in care work, um, those that have done less will compensate those that have done more care work. So if a person is working 20 hours a week and they've done five hours of work, care work and everyone else has, that's great. If a person that's working 20 hours has done two hours, they have to compensate those three hours to the, to um, to those who have contributed more. What does this co-governance accomplish? It encourages and rewards all types of work, care, love, and livelihood, per which this goes value agreement. It values forms of power to act, not power over, but power with, sent around the commons. It highlights effective and movement building work, which is often hidden. It optimally balances the workload to avoid activist burnout. It creates community empowered platforms for sustainable activism. Activism is a privilege to those who can be willing to be activated and have their needs met. And this co puts activism where we feel it belongs, which is in the workplace. It enables economic resistance. And the disco governance economic model enables federated missions oriented corps to practice value sovereignty and address urgent social environmental crisis. Next. So if you want to, the purpose of this, the purpose of having many governance patterns and many governance models and many discos is federation. So we have an economic syntax. So we have, if we're talking about livelihood, if we're talking about care work, et cetera, so we have mutually legible terms to design and federate, again, not scale our economic systems. We want this to be modular. We want to be able to, to have value streams and a syntax that allows us to communicate in these new ways and to provoke mutual recognition. If we want to get away from normative neoliberal economics and normative crypto economics, we need science and we need um, we need the um, we need the cultural solidarity before we design um, technical systems to implement them. And the way to make bigger, more complex artifacts are discos, which are stable circuits of value creation, um, composed of several discos, and disco clusters, where you can get together with various discos, various co-ops to do a specific project. And um, each of this has its own has their own value flows. Next. So if you want to check out stuff, you can go to Disco Co-op. We've just renewed our website. Um, so the information is presented a lot more clearly. Next. Thank you, Sant. Um, so you've got videos and stuff. Next. Uh, media, we have our publications, the manifesto, the elements, our series of articles and videos. Next. And what I recommend if you're new to Disco is that you check out the Disco Basics. Next. So this is an um, interactive site with pop-up pop glossary definitions. 
next that has been optimized for being in mobile, where we talk about what is Disco, Disco principles, origins, journey and labs, the futures, the Disco project, how to get involved, Disco terminology, and more on Disco. If you're not familiar with Disco or you haven't checked in since the manifesto, this is what I would recommend is your first stop. Next. <laughs> Thank you, Sant. Uh, finally, again, Disco Co-op, you can write to us at hello at Disco Co-op. Do you want to write to me? You can go to my website, Stack or Works, or follow me on whatever Twitter is called these days, or preferably in Mastodon, where I'm a proud member of Social Co-op, and you can find me there. Thank you. So I want to thank Sant because this 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 is an example of invisible work and care work. Um, I was a translator for many years, so I'm very used to like being the people behind the scenes that actually make those who are up in front uh, being able to, to do things. That's it. Well, thank you, Sarko, and thank you. Um, yeah, um, very happy to be able to support uh, as you present this, this work. Um, so we have um, two comments coming in. Uh, already, um, one from Ian and then one from Steve. Um, I'll let each of them voice it if they like. And then as a reminder, if you have more comments or questions on anything this talk was presented, please uh, type it in the chat or type the word stack and then I can add you to the list of speakers. So Ian. Sure. Um, thanks for this great and really interesting discussion and presentation. Um, so I was thinking about, I went to the, um, I forget the exact name. It was the uh, Radical Care Economics for Rotten Systems uh, event in Berlin back in July. And I was thinking about it then because we spent a lot of time talking about care and like the value of care. And I'm a social worker by professional background. And like, you know, it was my experiences in some ways, like after finishing undergrad and working a lot of like low wage jobs and all these kind of undervalued things that made me interested in that field um and I, I think something that came out but i don't know if it's as explicitly articulated maybe it's somewhere in the manifesto but you know it's like valuing of care work and shit work and seeing like care work particularly in organizations so even like administrative work um in some ways it, it seems like to me that's the crux of an alternative to like a dao model right where a lot of work can just be seen as like delegated to smart contracts or other kinds of like automation or, you know, agents or entities that are not human because it doesn't need to be done by humans. Um, but in some ways what Disco is arguing that work is also vital and essential, right? And must be valued. Um, it can't just be like automated out or designed in such a way where we don't need to do it. Um, is that a fair understanding? Yeah, um, it's, it's not a question, but I agree with your with your statements. I mean, in blockchain culture, you only if we talk about like an invisibilization of care work, it's what's off chain. Um, in the off chain side, you both have power influences by those who design the mechanisms, and then you have all the other work um, that's not that's not recognized by the by the protocol. And, you know, the shit work, the shit work that, yes, we do want to automate, but there's also beautiful artisanal work that you may want to do with more slowness and more care and more process and being able to to share the joy, the joy of that. So I think it's finding a balance between that which in one organization, like I hate accounting, so I would love for accounting to be more automated. To me, there's no artisanal contribution to it. In another organization, maybe there is. Maybe there is a poetry in accounting that I'm not seeing. So again, this is not for me to determine, but for each organization to see what do we want to spend more time on? And this is what the design of our tools should be. So we can spend more time on care work. And care work, again, both for people and both for if you're in a collective of designers to making your designs more beautiful. If you're in a collective of makers to make whatever, whether it's furniture, whether it's installation, to be able to do them with uh, more intentionality and save up on the work hours of the stuff that you really don't, that really doesn't inspire you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Um, Steve. Hey, uh, first I'd like, love to say I love the pattern language stuff. I mean, the original book is woefully lacking in non-urban planning examples. Um, so, uh, in fact, you know, I mean, I just kind of agree with everything overall, so I'm sort of fishing for a critique here, but uh, I would like to discuss with you your model of balancing 
uh, some people working more and some people contributing financially more. I think the, the way you have it set up, you could possibly stumble on loss aversion. And uh, I think I just have, you know, some ways to avoid that by tweaking it here and there potentially. So uh, anyhow, so as far as the question goes, you can respond to that. And uh, also what I wanted to ask about Disco Cat as well. If uh, I don't know if you mentioned that specifically and I missed it, but I just like algorithms. <laughs> okay. So if you find Alexander Boring, and I do, um, where we got most inspiration from Battle Language, so the same, I think I quoted that from Free, Run, Free Fair and Alive by David Pauli and Sigler Havwich, where they are, they're not really applying Alexander to Commoning. Commoning has always um, left behind a trail of patterns, which we can recognize, but they use Alexander to be able to extract. They actually also published a compilation called Patterns of Commoning. So if you want to approach it at least from a more in a more convivial sense, I really recommend that book. Um, in this course, there's no power held over by financial contributions. It's work equity. It's contributions, whether it's in care work or in voluntary work. So again, it gets you away from nominal shareholding based on economic privilege. Um, I would like to have a dialogue on what you're proposing um, because there may be, there can be like in the sense of a non-profit or something that does funded work where there's always an influence by those that hold more economic power. Uh, and even if this influence is not directly manifest, it's something that's there. So that's something worth taking into account. But again, um, it's not how many tokens you've bought um, on an ICO that gives you that gives you the power. It's the work that you've actually done. Yeah, I, what I was specifically concerned with is that when people who don't do as much work as other people in the group get penalized money, yeah. that hurts people, even if it's a tiny amount. It's just the loss aversion is just the, yeah. the fact that losses are felt much more than gains. Yeah. So that could be poisonous to the group potentially. So that's what I'm particularly concerned about. Absolutely. And I mean, I can tell you our personal experience in Guerrilla Media Collective. All of this is really good, but this is to have more clear discussions. This is not to um, set off. This is not to have a smart contract go into the bank account to determine payments and levy penalties. So we had situations where someone couldn't pay the, the rent. And the value proposition said, this is what this person gets paid. This is what we get paid. And then we pulled together so that person could pay the rent. And then that person um, came back. And this is the importance of care work. And this is the importance of small group dynamics. And with a blockchain without a DAO, you know, like the, the, the legality have no legal recourse. It's automated. It's, you know, the, the famous vending machine analogy. You're not going to argue with a vending machine. Well, unless you, <laughs> you thump on it, you thump on it really hard. So again, all of this um, value visualizations are mostly that, are visualizations so that people, so that normal people can get accustomed to talk about value and to talk about value and make decisions in consequence according to real life circumstances, because the exception will always be the rule. And um, the shit will always be the fan. And again, you cannot predict everything like via, via blueprints. So there's a reliance on dialogue and on good communication, but also on tracking. Because, I mean, if you're putting up, if you're doing like a resistance box continually for one person, then it's time to have that discussion. Also, when people are not able to contribute more, it highlights the factors that does not allow them to contribute more. And again, here we have um, ableism. Here we have lots of things that get left out of like many digital domains that we think that it's worth talking about. Great. Thank you, Steve, and, uh, and Stockholm. Um, James is next on stack, and then Mel has a raised hand. Um, so I'll put you on stack. Um, go ahead, James. Yeah. Hi. This has been very interesting. And I also. Um, uh, valued seeing Chris Alexander brought into the to the discussion, but um, I my I guess my question is just like there's off chain uh, discussions and activity that undermine uh, DAOs. I wondered if there's any outside of the disco um, process um, activity that has the potential of undermining the disco. And I'm thinking in terms of consensual decision makings where in in disco it's consensual, but are there any things like coalitions forming 
or something like that outside of the disco process mm-hmm. or any danger of that that you see yeah what we recommend and again this is up to its individual organization is consent um, i find that consensus brings with it um, power influences where people are obliged to, you know, like, let's unlock the decision. We must reach consensus. We must reach consensus. Consent lets me say, I fucking hate this. Um, then it may give me the pleasure of I told you so, I told you so when something when something goes wrong. So you can, and, and, and I think that dissent is not something that should be, that should be sanitized. So it's more, it's more complex than that. Within outside, I mean, we do propose multi-constituent governance, meaning that it's not just the people, again, to go back to our very loving critique of co-ops, because we love co-ops, don't limit the decision-making on economic decisions that may affect other to just the people working on the co-op, but also be in consultation, in consultation with others. But the, um, I mean, the big vision, the big purpose is to articulate these practices so they become second nature, so you can interlock and you can enter into economic relationships with with other people. And to me, economic relationships are not just transfers of value, but also transfers of information, transfers of um, intentionality, what you what you want to do. But an issue outside influences, when you mention it to me, I would say, well, I mean, you know, like the market or capitalism or the realities, the legislative and normative realities that we keep crashing against noble as our attempts may be. So, you know, I mean, we, we do live in this atmosphere, which is permeated, if not dominated by capitalism. What we want to do is highlight the power and the actionability of all the alternative economics, which we think, are, again, if you see capitalism in a process of catabolic collapse, part of the mission with disco is raising the ground. Is, um, we, we also talk about it like syncretic economics. Yes, you can have a legal form, you're paying taxes, you're in the market, but you're ready to step away. You're being naughty. You're practicing the other religion that they will not allow you to do to be able to step in this into this next system. But it's not easy enough. Yeah, right. I agree. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hey, thanks, James. Mel? Hey, I just want to say thanks. Um, really cool presentation. And um, it was hard to get to a question on this, um, but I think that the choice of the word care is um, a good one, in my opinion. Um, I think just, I, I'm here, this might be like a personal question, but I'm hoping you can kind of relationally, um, like help me understand this election. And the, the other words that kind of came to mind are um, like stewardship, defense, um, you know, and like why stop at care? Why not just, why, why not call it love, right? Like in that, as a, an overall concept. Um, so like, how did you arrive at like mimetically the, the shared sense using the word care, given that feature was like so heavily? It's very simple, feminist economics. Um, femini- both feminist and ecological economics are routinely ignored, we found in blockchain cultures. And again, if you're talking about decentralization, to me, that decentralization is not of like an informational topology or a series of transactions, but it's the decentralization of power. And the trifecta of power is capitalism, the patriarchy, and colonialism. So again, feminist economics has investigated the concept of care. Why not love? Because love can be uncomfortable for some, for some people. Uh, love, there's, um, there's a subtle manipulation sometimes that the word love is attached to. But again, the, the usage of care is because there's an economic, there's a well-documented economic tradition that talks about it. Um, sorry, because Steve, you mentioned the cat, the Discord cat. So this is community algorithmic trust. And this is a way to, um, to use kind of like the logic of a community land trust where a group of people with a shared intent find um, a legal way to perpetuate what that intent is. So like we get a piece of land and we make sure that this isn't exploited for your luxury apartments, but it will be a park. So this is what you want to do with your program and with your technical design. You want to have like a trust that um, continually reflects the inclinations of the group. And I mean continually reflects. So this is why we say like every three months, Check that your coordinate says that your value equations are actually coinciding with lived reality. Um, Steph, I see you have a hand up, but I think we have a minute left and probably don't have time to fully address this. Um, I'm going to share a link to um, a thread that I created in our Slack um, where we can continue the discussion. So if you want to post your question over there, if, if uh, Stocko gets a moment, perhaps we can continue the discussion there. Um, with the remaining time, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'd like to thank Stocko in particular for presenting today. Um, 
And uh, we also uh, have a tradition of applauding our speakers. So uh, on the count of three, everyone's welcome to unmute and clap or um, provide some kind of uh, affection of care uh, into the space. So three, two, one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For being my DJ. Uh, yes, of course. It felt like a whole collective effort. Um, I think we have somewhere between four to 20 on the call as well. So, you know, possibly a good number here. <laughs> Perfect. I'm going to end the recording now.